This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Also, make sure to check out and subscribe to our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, available only on YouTube. Honor and pleasure to introduce my dear friend and colleague, Ann Simpson. So let me tell you a little bit about Ann's very impressive background. Ann is currently the Senior Portfolio Manager of Investments and Director of Corporate Governance at the California Public Employee Retirement System, or CalPERS. So how many of you have heard of CalPERS? Okay, well, they, they're fairly well uh, educated on CalPERS. Well, here's what you may not know about CalPERS. It is the largest pension fund in the United States. It has approximately $230 billion under management. That's billion with a B. So this is an extraordinarily important um, financial services company here in the Sacramento region. And um, it has an extraordinary leadership position also on topics relating to corporate governance. Uh, and historically, CalPERS has been a true leader and innovator in encouraging companies to enhance the, the strength of their corporate governance processes and structures. It has been a global uh, leader in that area, and Anne is the leader of corporate governance at CalPERS. So we're really, really thrilled to have her with us today. Let me say a little bit more about her uh, background. <clears throat> She's a senior faculty fellow at the Yale School of Management and is a member of the Investor Advisory Group of the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board. She sits on the Editorial Advisory Board for the journal Corporate Governance and International Review, which is published by Blackwells. She's, and she was co-author of Fair Shares, The Future of Shareholder Power and Responsibility, published by Oxford University Press. Her former roles, former roles include Executive Director of the International Corporate Governance Network, Head of the World Bank OECD Global Corporate Governance Forum, and Joint Managing Director of Pensions, Pension and Investment Research Consultants. And she did a, an undergraduate degree at Oxford in politics, philosophy, and economics. She's a great friend of me personally and of, of the school, and we're very excited about our deepening partnership with CalPERS. So please join me in welcoming Anne. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen. Um, I'm not sure in front of your students, I should probably call you thank you very much, Dean. It's a mark of respect, but uh, thank you for inviting me to be here. And this is an exciting day for everyone in the room. It's the beginning of your MBA program. It's an extraordinarily important phase in your life uh, because I look around and see the many challenges that we have in the economy, in wider society, globally, and at home. And the good news is that all of you will be in, a, in charge um, in a short while. So doing this MBA is your opportunity to have the ideas, um, get the information, the learning, and also probably to forge the friendships that will take you through a lifetime uh, in your business career. So what I thought this morning, as it's the beginning of your MBA program, is that I would talk to you for a short while about something very simple and perhaps obvious, which is the company, the corporation, something we rather take for granted. Um, I think when all of you were coming to this morning's event here at the wonderful campus at UC Davis, this glorious sunny morning, um, I'd like you just to sit and count off on your fingers how many companies you think uh, were involved in getting you here. Um, and that was everything from turning on the tap with water to clean your teeth, the toothpaste, 
Um, the electricity, uh, you probably came in a car, I've no doubt you were driving on a road. Um, the oil, the petrol, the iPod, the laptop, the everything that you were Googling and Facebooking in one of the sessions that you weren't very interested in earlier. All of this at the end of the day, even the coffee that propelled you here when you were really struggling to get out of bed. We know that every single aspect of our life is touched by the corporation. So what I want to talk to you about a little bit this morning is where did the corporation come from? How was it invented? And pose a question to you as future corporate leaders, which is, is it meeting our needs and wants? We understand finance, we understand profit. At CalPERS, we're a pension fund, so actually companies being profitable is fundamental to us doing our job, which is paying pensions, not just now, but over the next 50 to 60 years, we're very long-term investors. But I want to walk you through some uh, thoughts about the importance of what the company is and the purpose of the corporation, and really then finish handing over to you to ask some questions about what your role will be as leaders. So let's begin with um, a delightful quote from the rather mischievous Ambrose Bierce in uh, the Devil's Dictionary this is at the beginning of the 20th century. His explanation of what a corporation was, or is, is it is an ingenious device for obtaining individual profit without individual responsibility. And this issue about rights and responsibility, benefits um, and costs, I think runs right through the debate about what companies are for. So let's think a little about that. Companies were invented as a form uh, hundreds of years ago, I mean well before the United States was invented, and I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. But let's just get a sense of the scale and the impact of the modern corporation. Now, the biggest company in our portfolio today is the most valuable company in the world. It's Apple. They're local. So I want to just tell you a few things about Apple. First of all, their turnover, their revenues, their value this morning, it's greater than um, the GDP of Poland or Saudi Arabia, Belgium. Uh, if you had access to the United States gold reserves, you couldn't afford to buy Apple. There's not enough, um, there's not enough in the coffers. On the other hand also, the value of Apple, if you could cash that in, you could actually bankroll Greek debt more than once. You could sort of roll it over. Maybe Angela Merkel would be delighted if that was um, <laughs> available to her. Now, because Apple's the biggest and probably one of the most innovative companies, and 10 years ago, remember, it was valued at something like $7 billion, sort of barely a blip on the radar screen. So we think about what's happened with Apple. So um, one of my wonderful team members at CalP has put this chart together, Ashley Taylor, thank you for this, to actually give us a sense of some other favorite, um, favorite names in the corporate community to think really about the size and the scale of the corporation. So Nike, their revenue is bigger than the GDP of Paraguay. McDonald's, I'm loving it apparently, is bigger than Latvia. Costco, bigger than the Sudan. ExxonMobil, bigger than Thailand. General Electric, dwarfs New Zealand. Amazon, dwarfs Kenya. Bank of America, turnover bigger than Vietnam. And guess what, Walmart um, has a value greater than the GDP of Norway. So the first thing we can conclude from this is really that the corporation, this ancient but rather simple invention, has been a phenomenal success. There's probably not an aspect of our daily lives not touched by companies, but also the global reach and the impact of the corporation is extraordinary. And for that reason, we really need to think about the governance because the accumulation of resources, of power, of wealth, and also the expectations that we have of companies are mounting all the time. Let's think about what some of those might be. Now, we've just looked at companies which make hamburgers and soda and, and cars. And it's easy to think that really companies are there for providing the luxuries of life, the trivia and the clutter that all of our apartments and houses are bursting with. 
things that we don't actually need. And let's think about what people uh, need as opposed to what they want. Um, this is the global environment in which you will be leaders. We have a population of almost seven trillion people. Where did trillion come from? It's billion. Has somebody been um, thinking about reproduction in a very energetic way? <laughs> As a lapsed Catholic, I would understand how that would happen. It's actually nearly seven billion. Billion, trillion, squillion, it's a lot. But the importance of this slide is to say that in the global population, 20% um, 20, 20 that's one in five people don't have access to electricity. Think about all the things that come with that. Access to the internet, electric light, um, all the conveniences, not just of the light bulb, thank you Mr. Edison, but the whole infrastructure network with electricity. Um, there's nearly a billion people who don't have access to clean drinking water. Um, again, that's a huge health challenge and it also has a dramatic impact on people's daily lives, particularly women who are usually the ones charged with children uh, of finding clean water for households. And also, this is I think probably one of the most shocking numbers, nearly 40% don't have access to sanitation. And that is therefore a, um, a source of disease, misery, discomfort. If any of you have been travelling countries which don't have a good infrastructure for sanitation, you will smell that the minute that you get off the plane. And we don't understand, unless we look back through the history books, that basic infrastructure for sanitation has been as important as anything that was ever done to actually um, uh, contribute to, to human welfare. For that reason, I'm sure some of you had... Uh, uh, recently that the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has got a new project and they're having a competition to redesign the toilet. Uh, now, Sir Thomas Crapper, English gentleman that he was, who invented the flushing lavatory, if you think about it, his basic design hasn't been overhauled <laughs> since he invented it. So this is a fantastic project, but the charge is that this should be a facility which doesn't require any infrastructure, doesn't require being hooked up to a water system or to electricity or anything else that we would, we would expect. So um, I think, watch this, because for me, we're talking about innovation with iPads and iPods and the cloud and uh, who knows what else, but actually in terms of impact on people's lives, probably to get a decent alternative to Sir Thomas Crapper's invention is a first order. So I applaud the Gates family. So we've got this situation of fantastic success for the company in terms of size and scale. But um, you'll all be aware, because you read the papers, you look online, you see the scandals, you see the court cases, company executives, chief executives, could not be more unpopular and jostle with used car salesmen and politicians at the very bottom of the list for the public's disdain, for their anger, uh, and at times for contempt. And we can see that there have been um, particular instances of corporate malfeasance, corporate incompetence, which have led to that. But also, we've seen some systemic problems. Obviously, during the financial crisis, the build-up of the subprime mortgage um, horror story, led to a series of consequences through an interconnected financial system that you know, the United States and other economies are still very burdened by. And if we were to try to quantify the human misery behind that, um, that tale, which certainly couldn't be told in numbers. But we've also seen specific issues which have really bothered the wider, uh, wider society, like executive pay as one calculation um, that's been done, which says, well, the, over the last 30 years, executive pay has increased um, 250 times more than um, average employees' pay. So I suppose the, you could, on the one hand, say we're more unpopular than ever as chief executives, but we're better paid for it. I'm not sure that that really is an equation that anybody is comfortable with. And then we've got particular concerns around issues like short-termism, which is an ugly word, but it's really something which is now endemic in our financial system, whereby the chasing of the short term is undermining the ability to plan for the long term. And we've got wider issues around environmental risk, 
not minding um, challenges uh, about the role of corporations in terms of tax, their interaction with the political system through the donations that are made from shareholders' funds, um, and a whole string of others, no doubt. And there's something we can talk about in a minute. Um, do we think Ambrose Pierce was right? Or certainly there's a kernel of truth in his observation, which is out there in the popular imagination. So let's go back a little bit. I think we sometimes think that these um, concerns about the company, the nature of corporate power, the purpose of the corporation, is something which really is a post-war phenomenon. I saw in the New York Times the other day uh, somebody writing about uh, when capitalists cared was the title. And the example was Henry Ford. He said, well, during the Depression, Henry Ford decided he would pay his workers $5 a day, well in excess of the minimum wage, because he felt it was a duty of his to make sure that in hard times people could pay their bills, but also it would allow them to pay to buy a Model T Ford. He understood the virtuous circle between private profit and public interest. However, what the writer was not aware of, or perhaps didn't refer to, is that poor old Henry Ford was taken to court by the Dodge Brothers, wonderful name. They had 10% of the company, they were rivals in the car industry, and they sued him successfully for not paying a special dividend, and instead, as they saw it, squandering the company's profits on things like lowering the price of the cars so that people could afford them during the Depression, raising, uh, raising wages so that families didn't go under in hard times. So way back, we have these real tussles about the purpose of the corporation, the distribution of profit, and this question about the governance, who decides, who controls this, has been there at the very beginning. And it's one, when you're in charge, that you'll be taking on too. But I did want to just um, put this quote up from Adam Smith. I love this because it's from um, his book, his second book, An Inquiry into the Nature and Causes of the Wealth of Nations. I mean, it's called just the wealth of nations, as though somehow that happens. He was inquiring and he was interested in causes. Um, but of course, this was published in 1776, somewhat memorable date for the United States, and of course, for the British ourselves. But this was Adam Smith's comment. Um, in the Wealth of Nations, where he set out many of his ideas about the market, the invisible hand of the market, trade, the role of merchants, he commented on what was um, then a controversial subject, which was the joint stock company. And those of you uh, who like to browse through these things will know that in Britain, where Adam Smith was writing, he was up in Scotland, no doubt considers itself largely an independent nation, probably almost is, but he was writing in the shadow of the South Sea bubble. And I'm sure you've heard of tulip mania and the South Sea bubble and the extraordinary tale of the Mississippi Company, which took down most of French aristocratic debt and was formed actually by a Scottish murderer called John Law. Um, but we're not going to talk about that right now. I just want to say that the idea of the company was born into controversy, even as far back as Adam Smith. And really what Smith was talking about, as he says, uh, negligence and profusion, therefore, must always prevail, more or less, in the management of the affairs of a company. And what he was commenting is on one of the chief features of a company, which is it's um, not really about using your own money. The first responsibility in the company is to accept that you are using other people's money. Of course, if Cowper's is one of your investors, we'll be paying great attention to what's happening. But this fiduciary concept that you are, uh, when you receive external capital, that you're receiving other people's money, um, leads to concerns about the impact and then what happens. So what happened in the South Sea bubble was as follows. Um, essentially, the British government was in debt it's no, no surprise, is it? It's been going on a long time. European debt was at the heart of some of those um, early scandals, even then. And uh, the South Sea Company was invented in order to, say, uh, take money from the public and say, what we are going to do is trade in the South Seas. Think of Argentina, which didn't exist then. Um, and they were trading in slaves, trading in all sorts of 
other commodities to and fro, uh, without sort of thinking through the fact that actually at that point England was at war with Spain, didn't have access to those trade routes. So the excitement around this company uh, rose and rose and rose, and sure enough, the government raised an enormous amount of money. But what happened when the bubble, even then, think about this, this is 1720, this company, uh, the word bubble was invented that long back. The company Im imploded because, of course, there was nothing to actually base any of these promises of riches upon. And um, what happened in Parliament, the impact on Britain was so profound and dramatic economically that Parliament, in its wisdom, just decided, well, we're not having any more of that. We will not have any more companies. Well, we've got a few that are going on and they're necessary to empire, like the East Indies Company and the Hudson Bay Corporation and so forth. But there will be no new joint stock companies. And the Bubble Act, as it was called, was passed in 1722. And companies were banned in the UK for the over 100 years. I mean, that makes Sarbanes-Oxley and Dodd-Frank really look quite pitiful as a response. Just, no, we're not having that anymore. Of course, this rather suited the monarchy because instead, if you wanted to go about some business, you had to uh, be well connected in high places, petition the monarchy, and have a royal charter. So business could still be transacted. You'd be given your license, your monopoly. And of course, really, this was a good example of the state, the monarchy, being anchored to the corporation in cahoots, if you like, for the trade that really supported uh, the empire. And we can talk more about these examples. but. What I want to say is really that at the very beginning of the invention of the corporation, it was a very contested purpose. Let me give you one more example, which isn't perhaps as well known. Um, when the uh, Nazis, the National Socialists, were elected in 1936, uh, were they elected in Germany? 1933, thank you. Um, we know the consequences, we know from uh, from the history books and from what we've learned and what we've been told and from our own relatives what took place in World War II. But there's a little piece of how the National Socialists, the Nazis, took control of industry, which isn't, which isn't very well known, which is that in 1937 they passed something called uh, the Shareholder Rights Act, which sounds like a wonderful thing. But what they did was abolish the duty of the corporation to look after the interests of shareholders and substitute instead the Führer principle, that the duty was to the leader. And this, you know, a little bit of legal tinkering on the corporate purpose was then followed by um, reforms and changes to the way that votes were exercised. And they did things like cancel postal voting or voting by mail. There's no electronic voting in those days, of course. But what they did was obviously go ahead and nationalize the banks, hadn't got the money or the resources to nationalize the rest of industry, but industry was to be anchored to that political purpose of Nazism, and they did it through tinkering around with things that we think of as corporate governance, the purpose of the corporation and the casting of votes. And the unraveling of that apparatus was a big part of the denazification process in Germany. Um, when the Allies took over. So that sad story, that sad episode, that manipulation of corporate purpose is a good example of something which I think gets forgotten, which is that companies are things, they're not people. I know there is a legal concept and there is even legal judgment in this country which says a corporation is a person. But this is not a person in the sense that you and I are people. It's not a person in the sense of having volition or responsibility, moral agency the ability to make decisions. We see, I saw uh, there was a, um, a documentary a couple of years ago called The Corporation, in which an economist said, well, if the corporation was a, perp a person, they'd be a, considered a psychopath because of their uh, you know, inability to empathize with others. Uh, come on, this is ridiculous, because the company is not a person. It's a thing. The best we can think of is that it's a robot, something that we uh, have invented and we are responsible for. And um, Ira Milstein, who I taught with uh, at Yale, um, had this wonderful analogy with Isaac Asimov's three laws of robotics. And he thought that the three laws of robotics from Isaac Asimov uh, should be applied to companies. And he's one of the uh, top lawyers in Wall Street. If you want to read more about Ira's view on that, um, let me know afterwards. So let's move on. Companies were invented 
um, to meet certain purposes. Those purposes could be benign, they could be nefarious. They're always contested. But the simple uh, design of the company is still with us. So first of all, the idea of the company itself is a separate entity from the business. That means that the company can continue even if whatever the company's doing um, goes out of style. And that's very different from, say, a guild. So if you're there in medieval England making woolen stockings and your guild of stocking knitters, um, your activity, and, and, and woolen stockings go out of fashion, as they did. Gentlemen wear trousers, do they not, um, these days? Actually, the uh, company, by being a separate legal entity, is a way of continuing, even though the activities within the company can change. So that's a good thing. That's obviously a way to be adaptable. The second thing about a company is the ability to receive capital and to aggregate capital, and that's the concept of being joint stock. So first of all, it's a thing separate from the business, and then you can buy and sell bits of the thing. That's the shares in the company. You're not buying one twenty-fourth of uh, the, the woolen knitting business. You're buying a piece of the company, which is the legal entity that represents the ownership of that activity. So that's a good thing. And of course, the revisiting of the Bubble Act and the banning of companies in the UK, no surprise, it happened when the UK needed to have a bout of capital raising to fund um, its colonial ambitions and the Industrial Revolution and all that goes with it. So the joint stock company allowed aggregation of capital. But then there's something which wasn't around in Adam Smith's time and only came in the middle of the 19th century, very, very important. It's the concept of limited liability. This meant that even though a company would go into debt, horrible, dreadful, terrible things would happen, perhaps, um, you were only going to be on the hook for the value of your shares. And until limited liability was battled through and contested politically uh, in many places, um, corporations had unlimited liability. And in that sense, um, when things went wrong, it wasn't just you, it was everything you owned and the shirt on your back and, as they say, the, sho the shoes to go with them. So the idea of limiting liability was in order to encourage the public to put their money into these enterprises. And the next thing to say about this balancing act on gathering capital, that was the purpose of the company when it was invented, was um, to ensure that it was possible for those who provided the capital to look after themselves. So the very early versions of the company's law included shareholder rights, like the ability to hire and fire the board. Well, that makes sense. You're not going to be there. You're not part of the management. You've just given them your money. Make sure the people looking after that money or overseeing it are to your liking and working in your interest. That makes sense. Secondly, um, shareholders from early, early on in this sort of primitive legal framework in the UK had the ability to call meetings, to put resolutions forwards, and, right from the beginning, to receive financial information. It's obviously one of the things in the early days of trading is ships would set sail and come back five years later and you haven't got a clue what was going on in the meantime. Um, but anyway, all of this apparatus, very simple apparatus, I would say we're still fighting in corporate governance to get it in place. And that's why we'll come back to Apple. So one of the things in the United States, just for example, is that you do not, as an investor, automatically have the right to hire and fire the board. That is something that's given to you or not in state law. And if state law says, well, you don't have to have that power, you have to, as a shareholder, then go into a major negotiation. So one of the things we did this year with Apple was file the second year running a proposal saying we would like the ability to vote no on the board. We didn't at that point have big concerns about the board at Apple, but it seems foolish with a company which for us is the biggest in our portfolio um, to really think that we can vote yes on the board, but we can't vote no. And another thing in the United States is not only that you don't have the automatic right to be able to vote yes and no on the board, you also don't have the ability to put forward alternative candidates. Because you could say, well, when things are really getting tough, things are really going wrong, as the provider of capital, you say, this really isn't working. These directors are not acting in our interest. We need to put new people forward. So another thing we did this year, we had two companies, uh, Chesapeake Energy and Neighbours. Chesapeake, you may have heard of, because they're at the center of the controversy around fracking. 
They're a natural gas company, but they also have some controversial issues like um, a Founders Well program in which a billion or more dollars was lent to the chief executive, the founder of the company, but this wasn't sort of actually explained anywhere in the accounts. So one of the things that's happened for the first time, those two companies, is a shareholder proposal which we solicited for um, actually passed. So we've now got a wrestling match with those companies Say, so, well, you know, the majority of shareholders say they want the ability to put candidates forward to the board because your financial performance is dreadful and there are uh, all these other issues to deal with about your long-term strategy and we don't have confidence in the people on the board. So, come on, we're giving you the chance to sort things out, but now it's time to bring new people in. Um, but we're still wrestling over the basics. So I think for you as corporate leaders, one of the things to think about is that the corporation requires um, accountability for the exercise of power. And if that's to be effective, that means the providers of capital have to have the right to exercise um, for their own protection. But I think also wider society needs this. It's a question of if not us, then who? If not we, then who? If it's not shareholders, who will you turn to or who do we turn to in wider society to exercise that role? Could be government. Other countries do that. Um, it could be workers. We could put workers on the board as they have in Germany, France, Sweden, other countries. Um, it could be regulators. Well, they have a tough time already, don't they, keeping up with events. Or we just rely on you know, the watchdogs and the uh, snapping at the heels, the media, the auditors. I mean, it seems absolutely right to me, the alignment of interest is between the providers of capital and the company. So as you go into your business setting, as you think about your future, this issue of accountability, transparency that must go with that, and of course, ultimately, responsibility. All right, um, this, um, this chart, perhaps you can't read it very well, but it's just a thought I want to leave with you, because you will be in charge. I mean, unless you flunk this course and you see Davis kick you out, I, this isn't going to happen. You're the part-time MBA students, you're the hard-working people who already have a job, have a life, and on top of that, are doing your MBA. So you are high-functioning, high-performing, uh, high hard-working people. So when you come to be in charge, some of these issues are going to be ahead of you as a corporate leader. This is a chart from uh, the World Economic Forum. And every year they do a survey. This is my copy that I'm meant to fill in, um, which I haven't done yet because I sort of got lost halfway through. They were asking about everything from what do I think is happening with chronic fiscal imbalances. This is the piece at the bottom. Great risks ahead of everyone. How are we going to navigate that? Uh, then they've got another cluster of questions around critical systems failure. Might be cyber terrorism, might be collapse of data fraud and theft. We know there's controversies at the moment, even around basic rights to privacy um, with some companies. Up at the top, they've got greenhouse gas emissions, climate change, think about it, water scarcity. How much of current industrial and corporate activity is based on the assumption that there's a continuing supply of water, there's an ample supply of electricity, which in turn is all linked into a well defined, well organized energy policy. If you start ticking that box off, and companies like Coca-Cola are doing it at the moment, you really see that within seven or eight years, what you think you could be doing isn't constrained by money, it isn't constrained by demand. That's old-fashioned economics, isn't it? It's actually constrained by the lack of water. Um, and another on the right, which we've already looked at, is the question of population growth. Um, this is about water use, it's also about food shortages, it's about the management of an aging population, how we provide health care. So you can look at this, and there's a wonderful explanation, and Stephen mentioned China, but the Chinese character for danger is made up of two characters, one for risk and one for opportunity. And that is really, for me, the map of danger, but it is a risk. These are risks that you're going to have to be thinking about and navigating, but it's also the opportunity for corporate solutions innovation. This is just a little reminder that we're in a rotten place uh, when it all goes wrong. It, it regularly does. Expect things to go wrong. What do they say? Hope for the best and plan for the worst. Okay, so just to wrap up, CalPERS, what are we doing? So, as Stephen said, um, 
Calpers has a uh, is a very big fund. Um, we're talking about companies. Uh, Calpers, if you're going to map ours in the same way, we were in a mischievous way mapping companies. We're about the size of the GDP of Portugal. So there we go. We measure ourselves similarly. Um, we've been thinking about what is it that we need to do as owners? What do we take on our shoulders as responsibility? Um, because there is no safe place for Calpers to invest if the system doesn't work. You can't take a quarter of a trillion dollars and find some companies to uh, tuck that money into. We have an interest in the economy functioning. We have an interest in financial market stability. And traditionally, we have spent uh, more time thinking about individual companies um, like Chesapeake, like Neighbours, like Apple, on specific things. But we all know in investment, it's asset allocation, it's uh, high-level decisions that determine your risk and return. So what we've done is um, develop a new framework, which we're now rolling through our investment strategy. And it's really thinking about uh, the creation of value rather than individual strategies, individual decisions. All of that's good stuff. Sometimes you get it right, often you don't. But really, we're getting back <coughs> to some old-fashioned economics, um, which is that value comes from three forms of capital. Financial capital, obviously that's provided by investors like us. Um, human capital, these are the people in companies. There is no company without people in the company. Just leave a bag of money on the pavement, on the sidewalk, nothing will happen, I assure you. You might think that there is a real economy out there with day trading and nano trading and nanosecond trading, but you know, there is an underlying wealth creation that we need to pay attention to. And the third form of capital is obvious, it's physical capital. Companies need things, they need resources, if it's not water and electricity, at the very least, um, they're, they're going to need a smartphone. Uh, and uh, running shoes, a bus ticket, or a car. There's going to be some transport or something involved. And what we're doing is essentially thinking about what are the issues in these three forms of capital. We're working with um, UC Davis on a research project which will identify what those issues are and how we can develop evidence and metrics around those issues. Um, but I would suggest for you as a corporate leader, thinking about your responsibilities for these three forms of capital could be helpful in terms of thinking, what's my job as a chief executive? You're going to have to deal with the shareholders. You're definitely and should be perhaps even first thinking about your employees and your customers, the human uh, dimension. And the physical capital, depending on the sector that you're in, will, uh, could well be at the very top of your agenda. Um, but the three together in combination um, will make all the difference. So we've looked a little bit at the history. Uh, the company was born um, into controversy, and thus it has been ever since. We've seen companies used for nefarious purposes. We've seen companies having the ability to uh, be a vehicle for the creation of great wealth and meeting of human need. And we also know that there's unmet need of an exceptional and both distressing level, but also a huge opportunity for companies. Um, so I thought it would be nice to finish with this, because if there was another message I would want to give you, starting um, your MBA class, is have imagination. That that is probably one of the most undervalued things in a business leader. And I think um, it was said best by Lewis Carroll through the voice of the White Queen. And you all know Alice in Wonderland, yes? Uh, well, there was another book, Alice Through the Looking Glass, which is also hilarious. And if you like logic and you like um, games, you should, you should read it. But Alice is laughing because the uh, Queen has just told her that she's 101 years old. And imagine in Victorian Britain, that sounded ridiculous, didn't it? People died at a, before they were 50. I'm 101 years old, and Alice laughed. One cannot believe impossible things, says Alice. She's a very sensible little girl, as you remember. And the Queen replies, I dare say you haven't had much practice. When I was your age, I always did it for half an hour a day. Why, sometimes I've believed as many as six impossible things before breakfast, which I think is very good advice for an MBA student. 
So let's finish with Louis Brandeis. He, um, one of the most important legal figures in the United States, he's the first Jewish Supreme Court Justice in the United States, had a remarkable impact at a critical time in the United States uh, economic development. But this is really the wisdom of Alice rewritten by a Supreme Court Justice. Um, and I think it's good advice for all of you as you embark on your, on your course at UC Davis. He said, most of the things worth doing in the world had been declared impossible before they were done. So I wish all of you well. I hope I can come back when you're graduating, find out how you got on. And uh, you've got important studies ahead. And all of us out there living and watching the problems that are around us are very glad that there's a new generation coming behind us to make a better job of everything. Thank you. Yeah, no. I'm sorry, I talked so long. I've used all the question time. Oh, that's awful. I just got carried away. <laughs> we can take a few questions, says the Dean. Questions, comments, differences of opinion? Good morning. Um, I have a question about uh, how CalPERS um, balances uh, its duty as a um, holder of California general obligation debt that uh, is also uh, dependent upon the same revenue stream in the event of a shortfall. How, how, does, how, how do you, how do, uh, how does CalPERS, uh, in, how do CalPERS internal governance policies reconcile that potential conflict? Right, so we're under a fiduciary duty which is set out in the California Constitution and that supersedes, is higher than, governs everything that goes on. So even the legislature or the day-to-day -day activities in California, um, even laws that are passed in California have to live under that fiduciary duty. So um, you know we're in a, uh, a state agency, but the investment office is governed by that, uh, by that. So there is no balancing, I'm afraid. It's our fiduciary duty is to our beneficiaries, full stop, period, you'd say. No balance, it's just fiduciary duty first. And there was a, a question here too. I just wanted to know what sort of programs or uh, services you might have affiliated with UC Davis to help develop people uh, possibly looking to work with CalPERS or uh, summer associate programs, things like that, to possibly even help make a transition from one in industry into another, you know, particularly finance. Yeah, so Calpers has a number of programs. Um, we have worked with groups like the Twigo Foundation to do um, days and trips and tours. Until the first of this month, we also had um, students who worked at, uh, at Calpers, which was like a paid internship. And unfortunately, that has just been canceled as part of the cost-cutting measures that were agreed between uh, the SEIU and the authorities. So we're in the process of seeing how we can convert those positions. Um, I mean, the students, I've had five students on my team, and we've had students both in the graduate and postgraduate world, and they've been wonderful. They've been a, a fantastic contributor. But at the moment, um, the, the current environment is absolutely rotten for that. But we do, there are inter internship programs like the Polanco Fellowship, Twigo, and others. And I'd, uh, you know, be, be glad to pass more details on if anyone's interested. Thank you. And uh, thank you so much uh, for your fascinating remarks. And and we do have some of our graduates who work at Calpers actually, so there is a uh, path there. So. Um, but, but I just want to uh, uh, say a few words of thanks to Anne, and what an extraordinary organization. So uh, she mentioned a minute ago that the, uh, the financial assets under management at CalPERS is about the same as, was it GDP of Portugal? Yeah. So we have Portugal just in Sacramento, so it's <laughs> quite an amazing uh, comparison. So. And, and, and what you've heard this morning in, in her remarks are two 
really two important themes. One is this whole topic of corporate governance, which is, I think, the most interesting and important topic facing our country today in terms of the economy. And we've got to uh, learn more about corporate governance, get it, uh, get it refined and adjusted so, uh, so our companies can be better functioning, can create more surplus and more jobs. And so I just can't imagine a more important topic for our economy, and I can't imagine a more well-qualified and interesting speaker for us this morning than the leader of corporate governance at CalPERS, which is really a worldwide leader um, on this topic. And then the second thing that you got this morning already is we talked a little bit in the Q&A about the school's emphasis on global issues. Well, you have just heard from a global person, okay? She has a global perspective. Uh, she has global, uh, a global background, and so she did a great deal to reinforce that point of the global perspective uh, of the school. So, Anne, we have a little uh, a gift for you here to uh, convey our thanks for your time and your effort today and, and being with us. <laughs> okay. All right. We'll work on that. We'll work. As long as it's just a bag of tissue paper. Right. It's not just tissue paper, so they're... <clears throat> I'm just explaining that the CalPERS gift policy means I would probably have to reimburse Stephen for whatever he's given me, but I will treasure, I will treasure we, this memento. We will Thank you. We will comply with whatever policies are, <laughs> are required. So. Thank you. Uh, anyway, Anne, absolutely terrific to have you here, and we certainly look forward to our deepening uh, partnership with uh, CalPERS.